Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel here at UCSD. Uh, terrific uh, opportunity for all of us to learn from one of the truly distinguished neuroscientists uh, in the world. Happily, right here for the last 45 years at UCSD, Nick Spitzer is Distinguished Professor of Biology in the Division of Neurobiology, and Nick has pursued some really groundbreaking, innovative work in understanding how neurons talk to each other. And the big surprise, I'll have him get into that, is how they can kind of change the language they use from time to time based upon what's going on in the environment around them. An example of plasticity that we've talked about before on this, uh, on this program. Nick, it's great to have you here. Bill, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about you and, uh, and your growing up in neuroscience and, and then uh, what's exciting to you now? Well, I uh, got my uh, PhD in neurobiology in Steve Kufler's department at Harvard now many years ago. Uh, did postdoctoral work with Ricardo Milady in uh, London at University College London and then came here in 1972. Uh, and over the years, been very interested in how activity, uh, electrical activity, can shape the developing nervous system. And that led us into a discovery of this fascinating subject, neurotransmitter switching. You're going to have to tell us about what a neurotransmitter is, though, if you will, Nick. Very good. So neurons uh, uh, have a somewhat implausible way of communicating with one another, involving the release of a chemical from one neuron that diffuses across a tiny little gap of uh, the space between the two neurons and then binds to receptors on the next neuron. And these chemicals are called neurotransmitters because they transmit the signal from one neuron to the next. Yeah, so neurons are talking to each other using this special little code, this neurotransmitter code. And that seems pretty interesting and pretty important, but I guess maybe we were never prepared for how diverse that set of neurotransmitters really was or uh, how they might change. But tell us a little bit more about the, the business of of responding to activity in the environment and changing who you talk to and how you talk to them. When I was a graduate student, uh, and perhaps you too, Bill, uh, we were taught that uh, there were maybe four or five neurotransmitters. Uh, acetylcholine was one, uh, noradrenaline was another, GABA was just emerging as a transmitter. Now we know there are over a hundred. Uh, uh, and the fascinating finding has been that if a nerve cell, a neuron, has sustained activity over a prolonged period of time, such as, for example, with a, a visual stimulus uh, over a long period of time or a, a stressful stimulus over a long period of time, the neuron can actually change the identity of the, uh, these chemicals, the neurotransmitters, that they make and release to signal uh, to other neurons. Uh, so instead of just a fixed pattern in one neurotransmitter for life, or even a fixed pattern of release of one neurotransmitter, what you're saying is that experience can change that. That's absolutely right, Bill. And this was a bit of a heresy because I'd been taught, I think most people uh, learning about the brain uh, are taught that neurons make a, one or more, can make more than one neurotransmitter, but that's it, fixed for life. Uh, and so to find that the neurotransmitter could switch uh, was really a surprise. Give us an example of a context, a biological story in which this switching business occurs. One of my favorite examples is one that uh, we're currently working on right now, uh, and that's a, a set of experiments in which mice are allowed to run on running wheels. And uh, it's a fascinating finding that most rodents, uh, rats and mice, others, uh, really like to run on a running wheel. They'll go in there and they'll run for hours. It would be the equivalent of a marathon for you or me. And when they do that, uh, in a nucleus in the midbrain, the pedunculopontine nucleus, PPN, in this nucleus, uh, 600 neurons lose acetylcholine, one transmitter, uh, uh, an excitatory neurotransmitter, and they, those same 600 neurons gain uh, GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, so this is remarkable, and it, it ties to a change in the animal's behavior. Mm. So let me understand this a little bit. So we run on a program that is uh, not fixed. It's a program that allows us to adapt to our environment. And what I think you're saying is that uh, changes in our environment really inform the programs that run 
so we can maintain some kind of level of ability to learn functions, that sort of thing. So what's going on in that? What's going on in the running and the PPN? How does, why, how does running change it and why, for gosh sakes, does that occur? Yes, the, uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, set of questions, Bill, because uh, many uh, people, uh, including you, you, you and I on various occasions, you know, like to run. It's a good form of exercise. We like to do this. Uh, we know that it has a variety of benefits, including the formation of, of new neurons in regions of the brain and the hippocampus. Uh, uh, we don't yet understand the molecular details of how the switch occurs in this particular case, but we do know that the neurotransmitter switch leads to improvements in uh, motor coordination for these mice, so they, they can now perform much better on other uh, exercise tasks. Uh, uh, so we suspect that the process of motor learning, uh, learning how to hit a tennis ball, learning how to hit a ping pong ball, learning how to ride a bicycle, that these may involve this initial phase of neurotransmitter switching uh, as a prelude to long-term changes in the brain that allow us to have the, these skills. And when, when you saw this change, uh, it was pretty specific. You were looking at one place but my guess is that there were changes at other places in the brain. This is, this is, this is certainly, this took our breath away, Bill, uh, because uh, this simple experiment of letting mice run uh, uh, on a running wheel for a week, so this is that sustained stimulus that I spoke about, um, not only is there transmitter switching in the PPN, the pedunculopontine nucleus in the midbrain, but there's also transmitter switching uh, in the uh, a part of the hippocampus, the, the hilus of the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. Uh, so single stimulus, we looked in two places and we found transmitter switching in both places. How many other places does transmitter switching occur? Uh, this is now an open question and very interesting for us. The biological result of this was apparently that these mice were better at the running wheel, but you said more than that. They were better at other motor tasks. There's a whole piece of neuroscience devoted to asking the question, does training in task A, let's say playing the violin, transfer, generalize to task B, let's say uh, knitting? So what do we know about that and what are we likely to learn by pursuing studies like that? I think this is a fascinating and very deep question, and I think uh, uh, it, it, many people are trying to work on this. Uh, um, I think that when the, uh, these mice learn how to run on the running wheel, and they train themselves, we don't have to train them, this is a skill they acquire on their own. They go from being very naive and clumsy to being very sophisticated and an expert. Uh, and when they do that, they can now cross a, a balance beam high above the floor. They, they dance across this balance beam in record time compared to the naive animals that are struggling and fall off a lot of the time. Uh, these mice that have been running on the running wheel now can uh, do a, a kind of log rolling exercise. We refer to this as, as the rotor rod. It's a rotating rod and the rod goes around faster and faster and faster. And, Finally, the mouse falls off, uh, but the mice that have had the exercise on the running wheel for a week, they can go to much higher speeds on the, on the running wheel. So uh, we suspect that, just as you uh, imply there, that, that the skill of one kind uh, actually has uh, spin-offs, has applications, has impact on other aspects of motor behavior. So, Nick, I'm just thinking about the application of this to the world we live in. We, we don't have running wheels. We may run, but we don't run in a wheel. But we do engage in tasks uh, on a regular basis, and we learn new things. Um, do you think there's a biology waiting to be discovered about how there is transfer of skill or ability to learn from one task to another? For example, um, if I learn to dance, well, I do math better. Is, is, there a, is, there, is there a piece of biology that could pursue that so we could, we could help, for example, families that say, look, you're, 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 your kids are doing great, we know that, but there is a training program that we'd like you to engage in that might actually enhance their ability generally to do better in school. Is there, yeah, is there yeah. a piece of biology waiting there? Well, I think so, and my friend uh, Mike Mersnick uh, at UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco, has uh, 
uh, done a lot to develop uh, uh, training plans for young kids who are having trouble uh, understanding what is being spoken. Uh, and he has found ways to sharpen their learning skills that then have a big impact on their uh, uh, school progress uh, and their ability to perform well as they come up through the grades. Uh, so I think that uh, Mike Mersnick's uh, work would be one very nice example of the way in which that uh, can be applied. And I'm guessing also that the underlying mechanisms are really something that are worth pursuing, understanding how it is that you respond to your environment, how it is that you choose to make and release a neurotransmitter. And, and actually, Nick, one of the surprising things is it isn't just me choosing, me, the neuron, choosing which neurotransmitter to release, but you, the next neuron in the circuit, figuring out which one I'm releasing so you can respond more effectively. Talk a little bit about that. The, uh, one of the fascinating features uh, that I think makes this transmitter switching work uh, biologically is that when the neuron changes the identity of this chemical, the neurotransmitter, the uh, downstream neuron, we call this the postsynaptic neuron, it's on the other side of this little cleft, this, this synapse, this neuron, uh, the postsynaptic neuron, changes its receptor uh, so that it can now receive uh, the uh, transmitter and, and understand the new language uh, as we go from uh, English to uh, Chinese or Spanish to uh, Finnish. Uh, and uh, this is a, a fascinating uh, a part of the story, uh, something we're currently working on. How does the postsynaptic cell know uh, to change the transmitter? Uh, there, there has to be some signal, we uh, uh, imagine, from the, the presynaptic neuron, and we want to know what that signal is. Uh, uh, an exercise in tuning the nervous system to allow it to perform in different contexts with different challenges, but nevertheless to ensure that the, fa that the behavioral readout, the cognitive readout is, uh, is adaptive, is yes. successful. Yes, we think there's a, uh, also a, a real possibility here that we're beginning to test uh, that neurotransmitter switching may play a role in various disease processes. Uh, um, let's take stress, for example. Uh, stress is, is a sustained long-term stimulus, uh, and uh, the clinical literature would suggest that stress can lead to depression, uh, may be involved in schizophrenia, other uh, problems problems that uh, we associate with different forms of mental illness. So we're very interested in now in looking in mouse models to ask whether these kinds of uh, uh, stimuli, stress for example, uh, will lead to transmitter switching and whether that is then linked to the behavioral outcome. And you know there are other, of course, thinking about other diseases, there's a very big interest in exercise um, really almost measured dosed exercise trials in, in people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So there's an example again, Nick, of, of a thing, of something that one can do, one can measure it, and one can look at the effects on cognition. So, so studying the switching business, the plasticity of the brain, how it responds, it's not just good for mice, it's good for people. It's not just good for people who are in the, 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 the wealth of their well-being, but also those people who are threatened by diseases. Couldn't agree more, Bill. And, and we think in addition to Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's disease is another case in which one might imagine also that transmitter switching could, could perhaps provide a therapeutic role. Uh, there we're losing dopaminergic neurons, uh, and we have the, uh, all the postural uh, challenges, we have some cognitive challenges in, in many cases, uh, and uh, the, the treatments at the moment uh, are, 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 are difficult. Uh, so I think there's lots to do here, and uh, we're looking forward to doing it. Uh, Fascinating work. We thank you for it, and we thank you for the promise that this work offers in our understanding the brain and how we can do what we can do safely and carefully and very well to enhance brain function for all of us. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Bill. And thanks for listening to The Brain Channel. Take care. <laughs>